Mark, can you explain to me? Yes, sir, there she goes. Hello and welcome to episode 298 of section 138. I'm your host, Mark Colley, and we got the whole gang here. We got Bryson, we got Jacob, we got Josh, and guys, we're two days away from the Blue Jays spring training opener. It is officially baseball season. The Super Bowl is behind us. And it is time to put all our focus into baseball again. Guys, how are you? Doing good, Mark. Shout out to Kansas City, the Kansas City Chiefs and Taylor Swift, as you mentioned, the Super Bowl. But uh, anyways, as you were talking about, pitchers and catchers have reported. The full team has reported. Vladdy has reported. Alec Manoa has reported in terms of people that are going to be watched a lot throughout this spring. And um, interesting vibes this year from camp. Uh, and I think Bobish had touched on that a little bit yesterday uh, compared to previous years. And uh, we're just at a point where we're going to see what happens here in terms of the expectations and the vibes around this team. But of course, uh, they start Saturday afternoon and, you know, let's get the ball rolling. Cannot wait uh, for spring training this year and for the season to start. And like, I feel like, um, like you guys can relate to this, Bryson and Josh as like fans of other teams. I feel like baseball spring training uh, and just like the whole preseason is more fun than like any other sport, just because like the weather's nicer pitchers report catchers report you get all like the clips and uh so it's it's like always a very exciting time but i feel like also just for the like the blue jays it's kind of like a weird time because it's like yeah we're excited but also why are there so many uh infielders that aren't that good like why is why have they made no moves like but okay like i guess it's spring training let's see what's gonna happen but still like it i i am excited I'm excited to watch that first game on Saturday, which we'll get into, but uh, it's, it it is an exciting time. I think if you're a sports fan. Yeah. I don't know if it's exactly the most entertaining because it's nice weather, but like, I kind of get what you mean there. Uh, But I'm not going to lie as much as I am excited for baseball. I'm not as much excited for the blue Jays. You know, this off season to me has really kind of frustrated me. Uh, As I've said many times on this podcast, you brought up the infielder situation. So that's something we're going to talk about today. I know, you know, we're kind of getting back into the swing of things, but so far there's just hasn't been enough for me uh, to be rejuvenated. My joy to be, um, you know, look look, like send that to looking forward to the season. The, The biggest thing so far is what the new cup holders at Rogers Center. So that that's where I'm kind of at. Like, like you said, football season's over. So I'm kind of disappointed, but you know, baseball, I'm excited for the Padres. They have a big game today against the Dodgers and uh, credit to the pirates for signing Mitch Keller. But that's, uh, that's about it. The blue Jays still haven't got back my uh, appreciation after this off season so far. That may have been the most depressing lead into spring training I've ever heard on this podcast. We've been doing this since 2017. And I haven't heard anyone be as depressed the week before, two days before the first spring training game. Well, that's what happens when you go from in the Shohei Otani sweepstakes to walking home with Daniel Vogel back. Like, like that's where we're at. That's the reality here. I'm not in a false image. Like I, I, (laughs) I'm just saying. Circumstances aside, there is no world in which I will not be excited for spring training. Hope springs eternal. You can have the worst team on the face of the planet. You could be your Pittsburgh Pirates, Josh, and I would still be excited for the start of spring training because it's spring training. Anything can happen. The entire season is ahead of you. And bottom line, you have your favorite sport back. And so that's a lot of fun. Uh, I do want to start this podcast outside of the misery by talking about a lot of the quotes that we've seen in the first couple days of spring training and with pitchers and catchers reporting and full squad workout, we've started to get some of those golden spring training quotes. I think the most famous spring training quote of all time will still be, you saw the trailer, they're ready for the movie or whatever it was. And exactly Vladdy's words, potentially the most infamous spring training quote of all time. But I do want to bring up a couple things Three quotes in particular. We saw one from Bobichet. I guess we can start off getting your thoughts on this one. He said, quote, I think this is the first time we're being doubted. We've always had high expectations. I think it's definitely a different mindset trying to prove people right than proving people wrong. Um, So it seems like the Blue Jays have a different environment going in camp. And Kevin Gosman seemed to say sort of the same thing in his media availability. Josh, he's does the thought that the Blue Jays have a different mindset going into this season get you at least a tiny bit excited 
shake the cynic out of you? A hundred percent. Honestly, that's what's weird. It's <laughs> like that was the most entertaining thing for me this off season. Is finally it seems like the ego is out of the way, and now they have a chip on their shoulder. To me, I think like you know playing sports like myself, I always felt like I did better when I had that you know showing people kind of proving doubters wrong mentality where it kind of pushes you a little further than it would be if you're trying to prove somebody right. You know what I mean? Like you have that extra fire. So I'm, like I said, I'm not worried about Bo. Bo showed me last year that, you know, he could be a key part of a championship winning team. My concern is with the other pieces, like besides Bo and Vladdy, we know they're going to have to reach star level this year for this team to really have a chance. And looking around them, is this the mentality of the group? We don't know yet. We have to see how spring training goes. But if the group can kind of, you know, take this on as a whole and kind of rally behind this kind of mindset, then, yes, that does boost my expectations. It does boost my fandom. That'll give me a reason to believe in this group. But right now, as constructed, I don't know. Like, we've seen this team. It's the same team that hasn't won a playoff game yet with the same exact core besides some minor details. So if you're just changing out the little pieces and you're telling me that it's a new mindset, well, let's see it. If there, you can talk. We've seen it with Vlad, right? Like you just said, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? And that's what I'm going to be looking for this spring. Yeah, honestly, I feel like the last maybe couple seasons, basically ever since the 2020 season, the expectations kind of got to their head. Like it's, okay, we get uh, we get George Springer. We get Kevin Gosman. We get, well, I guess, Matt Chapman a couple seasons ago as well. Like we've made all these acquisitions. We're... Uh, we're projected to be good. We expect to be good. And therefore we will be good. And don't get me wrong. There were, obviously they did make the playoffs these last two seasons, but they just barely got in last season. Like we said this last year that they only got in because what the Mariners lost and then Blue Jays lose their final two games. And obviously we know what happened in the playoffs, but uh, I think going into this season, like there is that anger. I think that like, damn, like we've sucked the last two seasons in the playoffs. We barely even got in. Everyone's expected us. Like I think it was the 2022 season um MLB put out their rankings and the I think it was Dodgers one Blue Jays two something like that and like yeah I can I I feel like it in a way got to their heads where they're like yeah we are we're supposed to be good and the, like I, I don't want to say that they were entitled but to some extent you got to think that that was the feeling like we are supposed to be good and this season that's not the case like I mean and to be completely honest there is kind of good reason for that like they've made next to no uh, impactful moves this offseason yes there were some I'm not going to sit here and say that there was nothing done but it's not like a few the last couple off seasons where it's like you get Ryu you get Gosman you get you know or you extend Brios you get Bassett you get all these players it's like the core that you have is pretty much the exact same as last season minus a few players what are you going to do with it and I feel like at this point like the core knows like if you're Vladdy if you're Bo you're Springer even though he's only got a couple seasons left on his deal well three including this season like if if you're this core, you know that you need to be better. And at this point, I feel like the the reality of MLB re, being like you're not actually as good of a team as you think you are might might be what pushes them over the edge. But we will see. Well, I've I have a question for kind of Bryson and Mark here. Like bringing up what you just said, Jacob. Like, can you like I would I used to be the most optimistic fan. Like Bryson can testify this. Like I used to be ultra excited i used to be mr game one like if they won game one of the regular season like i was hyped because like you know i would just start playing the parade i was overly optimistic but has this off season been enough to warrant like like mark said you know spring training yes it all like no matter what team it's an exciting time for sure the sport's coming back there's lots of hope you see the young prospects and stuff but has this team added enough for us here as a fan base to say this team is marginally better than it was last year. Have they done enough to prove to the fans that this team is better? Because you look at the additions compared to the subtractions. And to me, it's a lot closer than what it looks like from a distilled perspective. Like to me, I'm not fully there yet. Like you get what I mean, Mark? Yeah. Like, I think if you look at this team on paper, it's very easy. And I mean, probably I would say it's a worse team than it was last season just because of the people you're losing. I mean, you lose Matt Chapman at third base, which I know may not be a big hole de- offensively, but certainly is defensively. You're losing Brandon Belt at first base and replacing him with someone like Justin Turner, potentially in the same sort of DH first base. I mean, he's probably going to play third base a little bit, that sort of position. But then you also have guys like 
Daniel Vogelbach, who we're going to talk about, Eduardo Escobar, who like, yeah, they're minor league deals, but it seems like the Jays are considering using them to some extent this season. And I don't know if that's, it seems like a big step down from whatever the Blue Jays had last season. Then you also have something I'm concerned about in the rotation depth. Like, I don't think the the same sort of depth is there as it was last season. Or I, I guess last season there wasn't depth as well. It just didn't come back to blue, fight the Blue Jays because they managed to have essentially six starters healthy the entire season if you exclude Manoa in that conversation. And, of course, they swapped between Manoa and Ryu towards the end of the season. But, like, on paper, this team is worse. I think the things that give you hope is the fact that Vladdy looks really good. He looks committed. Manoa looks really good. He looks committed. And so, well, you may be losing some of those pieces and you on paper will be a worse team. I think if you can get those bounce back performances, it's not going to be as bleak as it may look on paper right now. So I think that's kind of where my optimism comes from. It's very far from an ideal off season. You really wish the Blue Jays did more. They didn't do enough to set themselves apart from the other teams in the AL East. I mean, the Yankees going in and getting Juan Soto, uh, the Orioles doing everything they did, having a great offseason, and the Blue Jays seem to be just kind of treading water and rolling it back with most of the same pieces and no new big additions. So, like, yes, there's a lot of room for frustration and concern, but I think the, the thing I'm hanging my hat on right now, the optimism that I'm looking for right now is coming from Vladdy and Manoa and the hope that their bounce back will signal a bigger turn of success for the team overall. Yeah, it's the only optimism I guess you can have because of everything that's happened. Another guy you mentioned who was, or another guy who was gone, um, that was, of course, I was here last year, is another guy like Whit Merrifield. And I mean, he, as much as he had a really bad or slow finish to the season, um, for the most part of last year, he was really good, of course. And he was also for uh, a, about a month or maybe just under a month, he actually took over the leadoff spot there too um, for George Springer for a little bit. So you look at that too, in terms of the depth and the kind of the utility aspect that he brought um, that's all gone now, of course, with, uh, when he went to, and he signed with the Phillies and then you look at it again and yeah, you lost Chapman, which means there's no actual third baseman. I mean, of course, Justin Turner is going to be there uh, a lot of the time. And of course the second base thing, is pretty similar to what it was last year in terms of there was no there wasn't really a set guy at second base and it appears like for the, the for the moment or for the start of the year they're going to go based off of matchups and they're going to go based off the hotter hand so that's when you look at it and for me yeah like for me it was a terrible off season um and honestly I'm actually a little bit different than you guys in terms of hearing what Bo Bichette had to say for me like as much as for as much as I want to get behind it, I still I still can't get behind what he was saying in terms of I get it that, you know, now they're being doubted. Like for me, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't make me any more optimistic, unfortunately. Yeah, like I've, those those comments yeah. to me don't really move the needle. I just yeah, I look off of previous years where we have seen quotes, we've talked about it plenty of times, where I have fallen for that. Um, and Mark, you brought up the the movie one and um there was a couple last year, but it wasn't as bad as 2022 where I just I said to myself as I guess part of learning uh, as a, of a baseball fan or for, with this team as well, is that I'm not going to be going over the over the uh, or over the top in terms of being optimistic uh, throughout spring training and throw quotes like that. So I'm more of a at the approach now I need to see it. And of course, that's probably the easy answer, but that's the only answer I'm going to give in terms of optimism not ruining my optim optimism around this team. So we will see. It is very obvious based off of how the, the offseason went and how it was very underachieving is that they are banking on those top three guys in the lineup. And if they don't bounce back like they were last year, it's going to be a pretty similar season, if not maybe a little bit worse in terms of the production like that. The pressure for these guys to bounce back, and I'm talking about a guy like George Springer at the leadoff position. And of course, I'm talking about Vladimir Guerrero Jr., those guys need to rebound significantly or else it is going to be another frustrating season uh, from start to finish. I just, I get that, I get that impression because unfortunately without those guys at the top of the lineup, you look at the rest of the lineup and of course I'll do respect to them, but I don't see anybody there going above and beyond where that's going to make up for a guy like Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Or George Springer, you know, I wouldn't say slumping, but just not, you know, playing to expectations that we expected them to. And of course, we're talking about Bo Bichette. I mean, he wasn't the issue at all last year as well. He was their best hitter throughout most of the year. He was a lot better defensively as well. Uh, of course, he had a couple of miscues here and there. So I think we're all confident that Bo Bichette's going to be fine. And the question marks are at the top of the order with uh, George Springer and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. So 
that's when you look at it like that. And in terms of other additions, I mean, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but it just feels like now there is a logjam of infielders and non-roster invitees where they're going to be competing for bench roles or platoon roles. And when you, other than that, that's basically the only competition that's going to, there's going to be other than of course, a couple of bullpen pen spots. And of course the fifth starter spot, even though it feels like going into the spring, it's Alec Manoa's to lose. So that's kind of what you have to look at this year. And, and in a way it is similar to last year, because I remember last year saying this uh, to you, uh, Mark and Jacob, that it felt like, for the first time in a while and probably for the first time that we were ever doing since we were ever doing this podcast, the team from the start of the spring to the end of the spring was already kind of laid out. And that's what you see is what you were going to get. It's a very similar approach this year, except you don't have a guy like Matt Chapman and you have a lot more of a log jam of people who are going to be competing uh, for platoon spots. So that's kind of where we're at with this. The only, the only way for this team of course, to be better than it was last year is it comes from the top of that order and it comes from a guy like Vladdy and George Springer or else it's going to, it just feels like for me from start to finish, it might be a very similar season. And then of course, pitching wise, like you were talking about Mark, as much as the depth might not be great, I still think it was better than it was last year. But of course, like you were saying, which was a good point is that it never even had to be tested. So can you bank on that for two years in a row? It seems like a very perfect scenario if that's the case. And it just feels like this year, um, and it's more normal, obviously, than not, is that this the depth is going to be tested, and we're going to we're also going to have to see how that kind of happens and how uh, the team reacts to that whenever that does happen throughout the season. Can I just quickly yeah. touch on what you said there? Like, I think one of the issues with this whole lineup is it's not like I guess maybe twenty twenty two is a good example. Like you had, uh, I mean, Springer was, I don't know, that was twenty twenty one. You have Springer, Bichette, Guerrero, um, Hernandez. Like you had. For, or I mean, even, even Kirk, he had a good season. Like you had five plus guys who easily like not could carry the team, but could pick up the slack. I think the the thing, or I guess the issue with the, the lineup this season is you have maybe three or four that could carry, but then the rest are kind of just like supporting roles. Like Kevin Kiermeyer, don't get me wrong. Like I love that guy in the bottom of the order, but he can't carry your offense. Like he's not supposed to. Kevin Biggio, much better season last season. Again, but same problem. Varsho, defense first as we've come to realize um you know kirk been up and down jansen good but like my point is is if your star players like your top three top four in your lineup are not performing this team is not built to succeed and i think that's just the biggest issue and maybe a reason to go out and get a bat obviously it's maybe a little bit too late for that now but you know the the issue is is like you, you're like i don't want to bank on them having bounce back seasons but like you kind of have to or else this team like it's built off of like yeah pitching and defense but it's offensively built on those top three or four guys well just look at the the division right like you have the orioles who did they go out who is their big ad corbin burns who did the yankees go on at juan soto like these are teams within this division they, these are the the blue jays opponents going into this year that they're going to be competing for this division race with and the rays the rays you know they could get they could sign us uh from the podcast and they could turn us into superstars so you know Whoever they get, they automatically turn good. But, like, that's the thing. Like, like yesterday, if you go even, like, on just, like, MLB social media and stuff and, like, you know, through, like, uh, Twitter, like, the Yankees videos that they're posting, like, that team looks ferocious. Like, they look scary. I'm not going to lie. Like, Juan Soto looks like he's going to have a monster year. Last year, you know, he, he didn't live up to quite the expectations, I guess, Padre fans were expecting in the power category. But still, that guy's going to be a machine this year. He's in a contract year. That's a guy that scares me. Baltimore's offense, their young core with Corbin Burns now to lead that rotation. What did we all say last year? If they had pitching, they were a legit World Series contender. Now they do. They have a new owner, new hope over there in Baltimore. That's scary compared to the Blue Jays, whose biggest ad was what? Uriel Rodriguez, uh, you know, Justin Turner. Or is, that, is that what we're going for here? Is that really going to push this team into a competitive space with those teams? It's like you said, Jacob, if – Number 27 and Boba Shed aren't on their game, then they're just they're not going to find that footing this year in that race for the division. Guerrero has to find at least sort of, I, I guess expecting him to go back to MVP form is kind of ridiculous given what he's shown the past two years, but he has to find something better in that range where he's closer to that kind of season. Because if they don't have these two front runners leading this offense, and this team is going to struggle because, like you said, they really don't have the guys in the bottom of the order to pick up the slack for them. And like you said, Kiermaier is is a nice add in the bottom of the lineup. He, he had a nice surge offensively 
uh, last season compared to his career. But relying on guys like that to kind of carry your offense uh, is a terrible way to go, and that's going to push you back in the wrong direction. So I completely agree with you, Jacob, there. The, the front two have to be the leaders of this group, and they have to be by a fair margin. I think if I'm trying to describe my level of optimism for this season, or I guess why there's some excitement with spring training, it's because, like, yeah, it's a paradox. You look at the offseason, it was not what anyone wanted. The Blue Jays did not get who fans wanted them to sign, and that was a problem. But then you come into spring training, and you still do have a talented team. You still have guys who are going to be good. You have guys in Manoa and Guerrero that have very clear storylines that you can follow, and you're excited about the potential of them returning. So I think it's this split of, yes, it was not a good offseason. Yes, they didn't do what they needed to do. But at the same time, it's spring training and hope springs eternal and you're going to have a lot of excitement watching a team this season. So those are kind of the two camps that I fall into. They're kind of in opposition with each other, but at the same time, I'm just excited for baseball to be back. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, we talked a bit about Manoa. I want to bring up one of his quotes that he had in spring training. Uh, this is another one of those great quotes. He said, quote, they don't give out World Series rings in AAA. Um, I think this is fun. I don't think this has the potential to backfire like last year was a trailer, this year is the movie, or like his famed quote, pressure is something you put in your tires. I don't think this is going to backfire like either of those two. Uh, so I think this is a fun one that, you know, it, it's a nice turn of phrase, but ultimately it doesn't really mean much past this moment, unless, of course, he spends a year in AAA. Yeah, I feel like he's just trying to say, like, look, I want to be a major leaguer because, like, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, the minors are the minors. Like, you want to be in the major leagues. Um, I mean, I could see MLB trash talkers on Instagram absolutely ripping the Blue Jays or you know, all these Twitter accounts that I don't even follow, but I still somehow see. But, uh, yeah, it's it, it's nothing like what Vladdy said last uh, or two seasons ago. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, I just, I, it's just a dangerous alley to go down after the way the last two years have gone. And yes, Manoa is one of the guys that has been, um, one of the guys that have been has been saying stuff like this the most. But I mean, the the good part from his perspective, like you guys were saying, is it can't get much worse um, already than it was last year. So if he's going to say anything like at all. You can only imagine it's going to be going on the up. And of course, the only way that does happen is, like you were saying, Mark, if he's in AAA for the entire season, which, I mean, I don't think that's likely, at, you know, at this at this stage of spring training. And again, it's his job to lose. I know, uh, I think Scott Mitchell was talking. I think, he's, I think he said he's down 30 pounds and he looks a lot better. And of course, I will say throughout pictures and videos, yes, that is true. But of course, we all need to see this happen in the spring and I remember with Manoa too is a lot of this already was kind of in terms of his struggles last year and of course nobody projected the fall from grace like what happened to him but a lot of people saw the early signs of this in spring training because of course he wasn't very, pitching very good in spring training but it's one of those things where you try not to make it an issue because it's spring training and it's only a couple of innings so you have to imagine that we're going to be looking at it a little bit more closely this year in terms of how he does perform uh, in spring training games. And if it starts off on a much better note, then I'm, of course, already we're lining ourselves up for a better start than it was last year. So in terms of where he is right now, career wise, yes, I don't think it could only go up in terms of what he was saying. You would think it'd be very hard for that to go down and backfire. So yeah, it's not on the cusp of anything as bad as saying the trailer in the movie and all that stuff. So I will acknowledge that. It's just, um, I just, again, I just hate doing this with these quotes, but I don't know. I don't know if it's a Jays thing or if it's just because we're only focusing on this team. Like, it, I want, I wonder if this is a common thing throughout all of spring training. But unfortunately, the only things that for some reason go viral are ones from the Blue Jays camp because I already know that that quote from Manoa has already gone viral in terms of what people have been talking about. So, when it gets elevated to an even bigger platform as well throughout media and everything like that, it's also just, it's a dangerous game and everyone knows how, it, how it operates. So I'm not, I'm trying not to get excited from that. And I'm also just cringing seeing anything like that. I just want to see them perform on the field. That's all I want. Well, again, I'm kind of on the different spectrum here. Like, to me, I, I, I admire this from a Noah because it shows that he's confident, right? Like I'm a big believer in 
always betting on yourself. And it seems like this kind of quote is something he knows that that could turn out real bad. Like Jacob said, that looking back seven months from now, that could be all over social media. But for a guy to go out who put in the work clearly, like you guys have said, uh, it seems like he's confident. And you know what? To me, that's that's admirable. I'll respect that. He's working his way back. Obviously, last year didn't go the way that any, anybody really thought. I mean, some people expected a down year because of, uh, you know, his success in the earlier. There was there was never really a full belief from the outside world of baseball that he was a legit ace and stuff like that. There was always the naysayers. But like I said, he, he's got he's got the stuff. He, we've seen it. If he's confident then that shows me his kind the kind of player he is, is like I said, last episode is he, he kind of, he's, he's that player that drags the team into the fight, right? Like he plays with a different kind of uh, pace to the game. Like, you know, he brings excitement. He, obviously the trash talk is something we all know that he likes to bring as well, but for him, I feel like for him to be confident like that and to kind of say something like that, knowing the causes long-term could be pretty bad. And especially not really for the team, but for himself, because that's something that if he was to make fun of, nobody's making fun of the team, right? Like, Oh, look at the Jays for what Manoa said about, you know, they don't give rings in AAA. Like, he's right. Like, they don't. But for me, that's big coming from a player that I think, uh, you know, when he's confident and when he's on his game, he's one of the best pitchers in baseball. And we've seen that. So, uh, to me, like I said, like Bryson said, it's just words. We have to see what they do. But for, for Manoa to come out and be confident saying something like that, that does get me a little excited. But like I said, it, you could talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? So, we'll see that here, right? Spring training. For me, it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, Manoa just says stuff. That's kind of who he is, at least it seems like. So it doesn't really mean anything to me. But I'm glad that it doesn't seem to hold the same potential to backfire as some other quotes in recent years do. Uh, it's, I, I think this is, it's a great quote, but I don't think it's going to backfire, uh, which is nice. Um, okay, the last quote from Spring that I wanted to touch on was one from Vladdy, and this is kind of a more serious storyline than joking about quotes that guys have given. Um, he was asked about arbitration, and he sat in on arbitration, but what he said was, it was a new experience for me, but I didn't feel bad at all. So I don't know if this is kind of wallpaper and is just what he's saying publicly and things are different behind the scenes, but at least from what he is saying, if we take his word to be true, arbitration... And hearing the Blue Jays try to argue him down to 18.05 million instead of up to 19.9 million didn't affect him or didn't affect his view of the Blue Jays, which is really good, especially when you are a couple years away from having to have these conversations in free agency or from right now having these conversations about extensions. Um, it's relieving that arbitration doesn't seem to affect it the relationship between the Blue Jays and Vladdy, unless maybe Vladdy's just saying this and it actually did. So I don't know whether you guys believe him or whether you guys are as optimistic as I am. Apparently I'm the optimistic guy on this episode, um, as optimistic that I am that these comments indicate that the relationship is all great between the two. But anyways, those are my thoughts. I, I just got to say, like, to me, arbitration, it's, it breaks relationships. Like, you could go across sports, like, to argue that much over such a small margin to me was kind of uh, the first thing that I took notice of. It, it was such a small gap in between what both sides wanted. And to me, this kind of was like a Blue Jays management sending a message like, hey, you know what? Contract negotiations are I do want to mention, I mentioned this last episode, but those are the numbers that they filed at. Like the Blue Jays could have been negotiating with Vladi at like 16 million and he could have been at like 22 million. So what they filed at isn't always a clear example of where they were negotiating. Mm -hmm. but still like you know over such a small thing like that to go into an arbitration case where you're kind of degrading uh who's supposed to be your franchise player your star the guy that if you are going to be good this season and when i mean good i mean a legit world series contender it's going to be having to come off mostly his back and the back of Bo Bichette. and to me to go into this it, it wasn't really worth it but like i said perhaps it was sending a message that when contract negotiations do come we aren't going to be a pushover like to me like you said Mark, they filed this at their choice. So it seems like they 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 were close, but just doesn't make sense to me why they would they do such a thing over such a small margin. And I know this does have long-term implications and stuff like that heading into next year and all that, but still just 
doesn't really make sense to me. I mean, we see it in other sports. Uh, athletes will come on and say, oh, you know, there's nothing, uh, nothing came out of this. You know, we're fine. And all of a sudden you'll see a player's performance just decline. And, you know, everyone, I guess, wants to come out saying, oh, the image is good and all that, even from a player's perspective, because you don't want a player to come out and say, oh, you know, they, they made me upset in spring training and blah, 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 especially when you're a player like Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Because, you know, you don't want to kickstart rumors like that. And that would be a whole other media gossip. But just to me, just a weird thing to do with a player who it seems like management is saying, OK, you know what, we're going to build this team for you to carry kind of the offense and for you to reinstill that kind of mindset in your group. You're, you're, you're getting these guys like Escobar and other pieces to help this core. If this is the core you're betting on, then why are you going to an arbitration case with this core player that you're trying to degrade his value? It just doesn't make sense to me at all. Yeah, I mean, I feel like th- one of the issues with this is uh, I don't think that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. would be the type to go out publicly and say that he was upset, first of all. Like, I think it was Marcus Stroman a couple seasons ago where he he flat out said, like, yeah, I'm not happy. I'm going to arbitration. Or exactly. I'm not happy at the result of it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Hit the nail on the head. Exactly. Yeah, so, like, I have to feel like, yeah, he's thinking like, dude, really? Like, it, whatever the filed numbers versus actual numbers are, he, like, you can't help but think, really? Like, you're, like, I know I said this last year or last episode, not literally nickel and diming, like, 200,000 versus 300. Like, there, there is a lot of money involved in this, but, like, really, I'm your, supposed to be your franchise player and we can't even agree on a contract. Like, it, you can't help but think it's a little bit frustrating. And so we'll have to see it. I mean, another guy that we haven't even talked about is, um, is Danny Jansen. Like he, he's going to need a contract soon. Like how's that going to go? If he doesn't come back, uh, I'm very concerned for how this pitching staff and just team in general will, will look going forward. But it, it is frustrating that like these core players are needing to go to arbitration, especially after Bo Bichette agreed to that deal. Uh, I think it was right before last season to like buy out his arbitration. It's like, like, I don't want to say like pay your core players. Like, yeah, they, the, the core players need to perform, but you also like you need to pay them if you want to keep them. Yeah, I mean, I saw something funny too, actually, about this whole thing with Vladdy is where people were comparing how they took Vladdy to arbitration uh, over one point eight five million, but they were also willing to sp- spend seven hundred million on Shohei Otani. So um, th- that part's also kind of funny when you think about it like that. But yeah, I mean, usually when there is a small gap like this, it's pretty common that both sides meet in the middle. I mean, I remember last season, right before spring training started this, it was kind of the same situation with Bo Bichette where last year, the blue Jays settled with everybody. And then we're going to be going to uh, arbitration with Bo Bichette before they extended him three years until um, he was going to be an unrestricted free agent. So we saw something like that happen last year. I was, I kind of had, I wouldn't say an expectation, but I did believe that there was a decent chance that something similar was going to happen where they would eventually avoid that and settle at something last minute. But I mean, over 1.85 million. Yeah, for me, I think I, for what you said earlier, Josh, I think I'm at that or on that boat as well. I think that this definitely feels like it was a little bit of a message uh, from the front office about how they weren't able, they weren't willing to budge at all. And this was really on Vladdy to somewhat perform better and to earn it um, because, of course, the expectations that he has had over uh, the last couple of years and, of course, since he's gotten here anyway. So it seems like Vladdy also is pretty stubborn in terms of not willing to move down. Who knows to the extent of how much negotiations did happen after the fact that arbitration was filed. And, Mark, I was actually worried because I thought you were going to talk about a different quote uh, that he did say, and he said something a couple days ago uh, where he – he flat out said on the record that he feels closer to 2021 physically. And uh, I just, right when I saw that again, did not like it. Uh, did not like it at all because it's just, um, it's just giving that, that dark chance of halt, false hope for somebody to be on. So, I mean, of course he does look good. Um, he appears to be in the best shape of his life, just like everybody else, which is good. And um, hopefully uh he does turn out to be like 2021. And, you know, at, if that also happens, this is going to lead to a longer term thing where hopefully at some point he can be here probably for the most or uh, if not the rest of his career. So it's definitely an interesting point because of the fact that both of these guys, and I also throw in Bo Bichette here, is that none of these guys are have been signed long term compared to what we've seen throughout baseball. So the Blue Jays definitely did this a little bit differently than everybody else. And yeah, it, it appears that 
both of these guys are going to be going to the end of their term on contracts and then going to be both going to the open market unless anything significantly changes. So I, I just see this as also one other step or another chapter in this whole process. And unfortunately, it's come with a lot of underperforming um, seasons compared to a couple of years ago. And we, re we really, for this team's, uh, from this team's standpoint, what we talked about at the beginning is that he needs to get back to that point for this team to have any sort of chance to be better than they were last year. So I think that's obviously the biggest question mark. And it just, but again, to add it all off, very strange how over less than 2 million, this did turn out to be an actual arbitration hearing. But of course, who knows how he really feels behind closed doors. Of course, what he was saying to the media could obviously be very different, but he also didn't seem like to, he didn't seem to give off the impression that he was lying either. But of course we don't, we don't read minds either and nobody can. So um, that's really all you can say and all you can kind of take away from this whole process from that. I really don't think the Jays were sending a message in arbitration. I think for them, it literally is just the money. I think the danger is that a player could think the team is sending a message and the player could say, oh, they don't value me, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. And then they take offense. And at least publicly, it seems like that's not the case. And, like I said this last episode, but I think Vladdy is smart enough to realize that it's not personal. Like I, I don't I think he understands the game more than someone like Marcus Stroman. Like Vladdy has been on the baseball field like every day of his life practically. And I think he he gets what's going on here and he's he's smart enough to not take offense to it. At least it seems like that. And whether that's actually the case, we'll never know, or at least I guess we won't know until he hits free agency. If he hits free agency and doesn't get extended, which seems increasingly likely at this point. Um, okay, uh, I guess we can talk free agency a little bit. Like the Jays go out and get Daniel Vogelbach. They get Eduardo Escobar. They sign both of those guys to minor league deals. Um, it's a homecoming for for Danny V. Uh, Good to have him back after two games as Jay in 2020. Um, I don't know. It's like they're minor league deals. It's only upside. For me, it's a little confusing why the Jays feel uh, an impetus to go out and build on their infield depth when they aren't building on their pitching depth. And for me, that is the number one concern this season uh, is a lack of starting rotation depth. And I know that they're probably saying, oh, well, Yariel Rodriguez can fit in there. I don't think that's a backup plan. I think that's relying on someone who hasn't thrown a professional pitch since 2022, who hasn't started since he was in Cuba. Like that is a recipe for disaster relying on him for depth. So like, I think these deals are fine. There's no way to be upset about a minor league deal. The only thing is I, I think the Jays still need starting pitching depth. Well, see, that's the issue is like, if they had even a like decent off season, and then they make these moves last minute. It's like, okay, yeah, whatever, it's fine. But like, when this is pretty much all you've done all off season, people are like, oh, the savior Daniel Vogelback. Like, what's he gonna do? And so, like, it's just it's their moves that like I like you just said you can't be mad at them. Like, what's the worst that happens? He doesn't make the team, and then whatever is free agent or even if he does make the team, like he's get he's promised two million dollars for this yeah, year. Yeah. So it's like mm -hmm. whatever he strikes out a hundred. Like it doesn't matter. It's yeah. two million dollars. No, yeah, that's but like, I think like they're, they're not bad deals. It's just when this is pretty much all you've done all off season, is where it gets a little concerning. So like there there isn't really that much to talk about it. Like like you said, Daniel Vogelback, he's played two games as a Blue Jay. Like there's really not much. Um, there, there's not much to talk about. But it's I feel like we have to just because that's all they've done. So. It's going to make for a very interesting uh, spring training, I'll tell you that, to see a lot of these guys playing and, and how many at-bats they really do get. Yeah, um, with Daniel Vogel back, I mean, he was definitely... It felt like it would... It's odd how that whole thing in 2020 where he was here for a couple of games, like, that was weird how that all happened and that, how that all transpired and everything like that. But, I mean, yeah, I mean... The only thing you can touch on what you guys were saying is that, yes, it is the league minimum. Um, technically, nothing can go wrong with that. But if it doesn't work out, it just goes back to the whole conversation of this is all that they did. And then that, you know, that's the part where um, you can also criticize the offseason once again. But I mean, 
I don't know how much expectations there are for a guy like Volgaback or Eduardo Escobar, um, who are both, like you guys were saying, uh, minor league deals and non-roster and Vitesse. So if it works out for them, it works out for them. Regardless, it feels like there's going to have to be a move regardless of, because of that. I mean, they, I know they already got rid of, or they already traded Otto Lopez and they unloaded that, um, that infielder spot for cash. So, I mean, I think there's going to be, if it does happen, barring any injuries, it feels like, if one of the two or both of them or whatever make the roster, there's going to have to be moves regardless. So, like I said, this is the this is something here where it's going to be – this is one of the the camp battles this year at spring training for platoon spots on the bench. And Vogelback is a lefty. Uh, I guess he brings that a little bit different to the table than a guy like Eduardo Escobar. So, we'll see what happens with that. He has some power. I mean, going back to his last couple of years as well when he's been with the Pirates and he's been with the Mets – um, he does have some power, you know, still, I think he peaked though in 2019, again, when it was the 30 home runs with the Mariners. And I remember that was kind of the whole thing when he came over here for two games in 2020 that, you know, Blue Jays fans were kind of looking forward to in terms of, can he get back to that and replicate that? Of course, that whole season, um, just was different in so many ways. And then ever since that as well, uh, the last couple of years, he hasn't gotten back to that point also. So it's a, it's an option off the bench, and um, regardless if it works out or if it doesn't work out, technically yes, it it doesn't. You know, it, there's no long term impacts to the franchise. But of course, if it doesn't work out, you st- you're still scratching your head at this is all that they did to bring in another bat. Honestly, one thing I will say, like the absolute ceiling for Vogelback is a little bit higher than Escobar in my eyes. Like I, I like, I've been a big fan of Escobar throughout his career. That's a guy you know I've perennially drafted and. Uh, MLB fantasy in our leagues. Like that's usually the guy I'll take in the, the middle to late rounds. But so, you know, to me, that's a little bit exciting. He is a bit of an older player, so I don't know how much he does have left. But um, as a veteran presence, to me, the Escobar signing, uh, I'm okay with it. Vogelback, though, is the one that intrigues me more only because I feel like there's there's something with his game that nobody's really talking about. And that's the fact that he sees a lot of pitches. He is one of the best in baseball at driving up pitch counts. So, you know, to me, this is a guy that can kind of sneak into a leadoff spot if this team is struggling. Now, that's the absolute ceiling, right? If everything goes right and stuff like that. Um, he does, uh, you know, he like when I remember when he was with the Pirates, like he, he could get on base, like he could walk, like stuff like that. Um, but, you know, that like, like Bryson said, he does have some pop in his game, but he does see a lot of pitches. So, to me, that's where the intrigue comes from. Like, obviously, he's not going to bring much to you uh, in other categories. Otherwise, you know, this wouldn't be a, the contract that he's here at. But like I said, he sees a lot of pitches. So to me, that's uh, one thing I think uh, management was kind of looking at, especially because we already brought up the uh, the Merrifield situation last year where he kind of took over that leadoff spot. Um, but again, that's just the absolute ceiling of this move. That's to me what I kind of see in this move. If if everything does go right, which is a small margin, uh, this is a guy that, like Bryson said, a left-handed bat that uh, isn't bad at driving up pitch counts. So, like, yeah, you can talk yourself into thinking he's a good player if you want to, or a good sign. Like, it's not, and that's not to insult. Like, it is. It's a whatever. I mean, like. He had a 104 OPS plus last season. In 2022, he had a 126 OPS plus. So, like, I, he he can be a valuable offensive bat um, if you want to get excited about a signing like this. For me, it's just uh, a minor league deal. Um, and I wish they were going out and getting pitching depth at this point. Um, uh, in terms of hitting, there are still two guys on the market, and that's Matt Chapman and Cody Bellinger. Uh, like we we mention these names every episode, we keep circling back on it. Eventually, this conversation has got to end because spring training games start today. They start on Saturday for the Blue Jays. Let's go, Padres. There's got to be an end to this conversation at some point. I don't even want to talk about these guys anymore. I'm just putting it out there in the universe that they still exist on the free agent market. It's embarrassing, and I though. think. Yeah, like it's embarrassing. Yeah. And they all have a common denominator of who the, who their agent is. And you guys know my opinion on Scott <laughs> Boris. That that's uh, he's very bad for baseball. I'm not going to say what I said before, but jeez, wow. Okay, well maybe yeah. we can end the pod with this. Nowhere, he's not good for baseball. <laughs> hey, well, <laughs> <laughs> that again, Jacob? Where did that come I from? I said, <laughs> 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 I said, 
<laughs> he's bad for it. Well, like you, I'm okay. I don't want to call Matt Chapman and Cody Bellinger star players, but like you have notable uh, players that have had good careers that are not signing because of an agent and a Cy Young winner. Yeah, well, yeah, that too. Like it's on Heyman of the Blue Jays, right here, Jacob Cock, your favorite, <laughs> your favorite media caster, right here. Jacob, but you're you're kind of right though. Like I don't blame you. Like with your with your thoughts, I think we all kind of here are kind of frustrated with Boris and all the stuff he does. No, nah, uh, I get your money, Cody oh, Bellinger. Get your money, Blake Snell. Get your money. Come on, you can't okay. tell me. This let's be honest. Favorite. Okay, Team let's Boris be honest here. Boris. Let's be honest here. The Jays aren't signing any of these players, so the longer they go on the free agent market means the longer it will take for them to get up to full speed and yes. full performance, which is better for the Blue Jays. Like, I, I don't see a downside here. <laughs> nah, I mean, that, I, to me, I, like, this... If Blake Snell takes another two weeks to sign, that means he is not going to be fully worked out for the first two weeks of the season. And if he signs with a team like the Yankees, that means they don't have their ace for two weeks. Like, mm -hmm. that's... There's there's only good that comes from this because the Jays aren't signing these guys. So, oh, okay, you're looking I at no right no level of frustration. Baseball, like outside terms, like we have key free agents still on the market. To me, as a fan of the game, I don't like that. Now, as a Blue Jays fan, sure, but I, overall, you want these guys on the field. You want to see how they do. If if we let's say the Jays sign Bellinger, damn right, I want to see him in spring training. I want to see how he looks. I don't want to wait here and. For, like you said, for, for baseball players to catch up to speed, it's a lot longer than other sports. And, you know, people overlook that because I guess maybe they sound as a physically demanding sport. But getting your swing right, getting your pitches right, that takes time, that takes effort, and that takes commitment. And, you know, to me, seeing this from Boris, like Jacob said, it's not it's not good for the game. Put that in quotation marks if you want because, you know. But it's not, it's not Scott Boris's fault. He's playing within the rules. He thinks his clients can get more money if they wait longer. And of course he's going to do that. Like if you want these players to sign, have a deadline, have a signing window before the season starts. Like to me, this is not on Scott Boris for doing these things. If you want, to, if you want the league to work differently, the league has to make these rules, and the MLBPA has to agree to them. Like, see, I see. I don't what see you this mean. as one one agent's fault. I don't know. I, oh, no. I see what you mean, but like it's all his clients, and yeah, I'm like. like yeah. Like, and he thinks he can get more money. His job good, is to no, get the most money good, for his clients. His clients want to make the most money. Yes, like, good on that. I, I like that. I understand I'm, that. But as a fan, like, how am I supposed to go and talk to someone and be like, "Hey, watch baseball." Oh, who plays there? Oh, well, like half the, the damn players. It's from spring one training. Like, Let's okay, be honest. Yeah, okay, no yes. one's watching spring training if you're not a baseball fan. Okay, yes. No one's like, watching this. At no the one same cares time, that Bryce Harper didn't show up until week two of Philly's camp when he signed. No one cares because he was there for opening. Like, it's, but at the same time, no one why cares do people... if you're not a baseball fan. And if you're a baseball fan, you put up with this stuff anyways. Yes, but like when I look at things like the NBA and the NHL, People enjoy this because it's like, oh, like it's July 1st and your team is pretty much already set. Like if I'm these players, I'm like, Jesus Christ, like I, I'm it's the season starts in less than a month and I'm still not signed. Or I'm, you know, I'm looking at all these, like, like I said, I don't want to call them star players, but I'm looking at notable players that are not signed. It's like, like, how are we supposed to expand the game when we can't even expand like the rosters of teams because players aren't signing? I don't see the connection between expanding. I know. I don't. I don't. And... I don't know where I was going with that. But like, I, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, the, how are you supposed to like convince people to watch this when like like I can, I can understand being frustrated as a fan, but it's embarrassing. I don't think it's Scott Boris's fault. I like if you want to change the league and the MLBPA have to do something. Scott Boris is doing yeah. this because he can make more money if he does this. But that's the bottom line. Like he's but, not doing this to antagonize fans or make up a set or whatever. Like. I, I don't get it, though. Like, how is this increasing their chances when the Cubs are calling him out and saying, yeah, you know, we're, we're talking. We're just we're not negotiating, though. Like these teams are they're not budging at these guys. And at some point, if these guys are going to want to play, they're going to have to budge on themselves for a guy like Matt Chapman, who probably isn't going to get the payday that he thought. Eventually, his best course of action is going to have to come back and go on a probably maybe a one or two year deal again and try and revamp his value and try again next year. So. That's that's how I look at it. I don't know 
if it, inc- I get it for some of those guys, maybe like Blake Snell, sure. But I also look at some of these other guys and I don't under, I don't see how it increases the chances that them holding out is going to get them more money down the line. But of course that is his approach. And uh, I guess I'll, I will ask you guys one more thing before we wrap it up is I think, well, Mark, I know you talked about it, but like, <laughs> is there, you guys think it's 0% that a guy like Matt Chapman can still come back? To the Blue Jays, uh, zero. Yeah. No, there's at this point, there's no way. Chapman, so, Chapman to me is a little bit higher. Like Bellinger yeah. and other guys, no. But Chapman, Chapman's at least a little bit of a bomb for me. Not that I'm expecting it. Not that I'm hoping for it. I just think like if you look at like an odds ratio, I think it'd be a little bit closer. But nothing like in in realm of I think it's going to happen. Like it, it's still a long shot. Um, like you know, it's been reported they're kind of done with their major additions in quotes. So. But like I said, if you're comparing it to the outside market, I do think Chapman would have the best odds at a return, and I'm not sure that's going to be uh, well liked by the fan base. But that's just, in my opinion, the the odds on if they were to add one of those guys. Yeah, Chapman's the most likely, but none of them are likely. Well, with that, we'll wrap up our episode. We are two days away from the first spring training game, and we're very excited to see Ricky Tiedemann make the start. Uh, I know it's only going to be two or three innings, but it's still exciting for him to get the nod there, the honorary nod at the start of spring training. As always, you can support our podcast by checking us out on social media, subscribing on YouTube, um, or just telling a friend about our podcast so we can spread the word. Um, All right, we will catch you next time after we have some game action under our belts. See you then.